Dr. Kurin, could you tell me something about the beginning of Amul? Why it started, how it started? During British regime, and I'm referring now to 1942 to 46, the government of Bombay discovered that the milk supply in Bombay was so bad that many Englishmen were falling sick. And so they invited an expert. And those days, as in these days also, experts have to be white in color. But those days he had also to be an Englishman. So an Englishman was brought to India to look into the milk situation of Bombay. He submitted a report, and the report can best be understood by one sentence he wrote in it, that the milk supply of Bombay is bacteriologically inferior to the gutter water of London. Therefore, clearly, the government felt compelled to intrude into the milk business. These days, there is a lot of talk of privatization and how private sectors are very efficient and so on. And you should remember that the entire milk supply was in Bombay, as in the throughout the country, was then in private hands. And they had made milk worse than the gutter water of London. And now the public sector was to intrude to improve matters. And uh, as you know, the, the imperial power, when it has to intrude, it intrudes by creating a department, headed by an Englishman as the milk commissioner and uh, others under him. And the milk commissioner was asked to improve the milk supply of Bombay. Even those days, it was known that there was a district in Bombay state called Kera district, which was probably the best milk producing country in India. And this British milk commissioner came to Bombay, came to Anand to find out whether milk can travel to Bombay from Anand. At Anand at that time, there was a privately owned dairy called Polson Dairy. And Polson's butter those days was as famous as Amul butter is today. And Mr. Polson himself was a Parsi gentleman called Pistanji. But you know, you cannot obviously market Pistanji butter. So he anglicized his name to Polson. And uh, he was an uneducated man. He could not uh, read or write English. But he made up for it by wearing a silk suit every day and a pith helmet and so on. But he was one of the pioneers of our dairy industry and all of us respect him. So he was approached and he was asked, can you supply liquid milk from Anand to Bombay, a distance of some by train, some 300 miles? He was clever enough to have as the manager of his dairy a New Zealander. And though it was an Indian company. And this New Zealander said he will try out an experiment. So what he did was to pasteurize, which means heat and cool milk in his dairy. Keep it in the cold store at low temperatures of 3-4 degrees centigrade. Then at 11 o'clock at night, a train comes from Ahmedabad called the Gujarat Mail, stops for a minute or two at Anand. And he took these cans wrapped with gunny bags and chilled water poured on it to keep it cool. Took it to the railway station, poured more chilled water, then put the six cans of milk into the guard's van and sent it to Bombay. The milk commissioner and his officers went to the station to receive this milk. And to their pleasant surprise, they found, even though the milk was transported at such uh, at such uh, crude way, even then, the milk was in good condition when it reached Bombay and could be marketed in Bombay. So then they told Paulson, will you do this on a regular basis? And that was how the Bombay milk scheme started. Now, Paulson was, uh, no, though not educated, was a clever businessman and a good businessman. 
He then told the government that if you are to get more milk, you must help me. You must pass a law preventing others from collecting milk from the villages around Anand. Then I can collect all the milk and I'll give it to you and you can sell more and more milk. So the government of Bombay passed this law, which really meant Paulson had the monopoly of collection in the villages around Anand. Now Paulson's system of collection was through milk contractors, one in each village. And therefore the milk contractor became hmm, the boss of the village. And um, he could collect the milk by paying as little as possible. He could pay a few important people a higher price. But the poorer sections of the population, he pay, bought the milk at very low price. And um, he found that by doing so, he could make a lot of money, which he did, and became the dada of the village. His milk contractors became the dadas of the village. The, while the government of Bombay was happy, the consumers in Bombay were happy. Paulson, of course, was very happy because his shareholders got good dividends. The only unhappy people were the farmers of Kerala district because they knew what price their milk was selling in Bombay and how they were getting only a very small fraction of that price. So they went to their leader in that district. His name was Sardar Vallabhai Patel and told him, look, Sahib, what is happening? And then Sardar Patel said that if you want to get the maximum share of the consumer's rupee in Bombay, then you must own the dairy. You must gain command over the procurement, processing and marketing of milk. And therefore, you must throw Paulson out. And he said, if you are prepared to fight with the government, I am prepared to lead you. But please understand, in any fight there will be losses. And in this case, the losses will be upon you. They said, we are prepared to bear the losses. So he said, well, I will send my deputy to you. Follow his advice. The deputy he sent was Moraji Desai. And Moraji Desai held a meeting of farmers of Kerala district under a banyan tree in a village called Chaklasi, seven miles from Anand. And one resolution was passed that the farmers of Kerala district are going on strike against the Bombay Mill Scheme. They will supply milk only if they are allowed to form their own cooperatives. And a cooperative union of their societies should be permitted to set up a dairy. Now, this resolution was passed and the British government refused to agree and rejected their resolution. So, Moraji Desai advised the farmers to go on strike against the Bombay Mill Scheme and not to sell their milk to anyone, least of all to Paulson's contractors. And the entire milk going from Anand to Bombay stopped. So, the Bombay Mill Scheme collapsed because they had no other source of milk. And then the British government milk commissioner came to Anand, saw that the spirit of the people was very strong. And his deputy was an Indian. He told the milk commissioner, these people are all very strong people. We can't break their strike. Why don't you concede their demand? You see, cooperatives, cooperatives to be formed in Anand. You see, this is not New Zealand. This is not Denmark. This is not Holland. This is India. How can cooperatives succeed? And look at their leaders. Gandhi Topi is God. He does not speak English. He has no technical knowledge of handling milk. He has no concept of how complicated it is. Concede the demand. It will only go to dogs. So the demand was conceded. And two village cooperatives were formed and one union. And they were handling 200 litres of milk a day. But the union had no processing capacity. So the milk was being sent to Polson's for being processed. And then Polson will say, this milk smells, there's a lizard in it, there are flies in it, and we're rejecting the milk. And in fact, they were conducting themselves in such a manner as to bust the cooperatives. It was at this point of time 
that India became free. And the chairman of the cooperative, Thirubhavan Das Patel, an extremely fine man, of great character, competence. This man then came to Delhi and met Sada Patel, who was then the deputy prime minister, and told him, Sahib, look, the, we are not able to supply milk to Polson. He is creating a lot of troubles. There is an unused dairy belonging to the Ministry of Agriculture, lying in Anand. It was used during World War I to manufacture cheese to supply to the British troops in Mesopotamia. Since then it is lying unused. Give us that dairy so that we don't have to send our milk to Poles. Sardar Patel talked to the Minister of Agriculture at that time, Babu Rajendra Prasad. And Thirubhavandas was invited by him to meet him. And the dairy was given to the cooperative on 9,000 rupees lease against the objections of the Ministry of Agriculture officials. And then the dairy had processing facilities and the cooperative for the first time began to send milk to Bombay, processed in their own factory. And uh, since then, it never looked back from 200 litres a day. Today that cooperative, that district cooperative is handling 10 lakh litres of milk a day. And that has replicated itself, not only in Kerala district, it has been followed by farmers in other districts, Baroda, Surat, Broch, then in North, uh, Sabarkanta, Benaskanta, Mesana. And so every district, including Kutch, has its own district union. And between the whole of them, they have formed a state federation. Now, my more important job than the chairmanship of the dairy board is I am the elected chairman of that Gujarat Cooperative Milk Marketing Federation. Our business today is 1,600 crores and we are the largest food business in India. To uh, what do you attribute the success of Amul? The success of Amul I will attribute to the fact that it was opposed by government. You see, when everybody opposes you, you either survive or you die. If you survive, you become strong. Nobody becomes strong unless he battles. And Amul, if you want to kill a cooperative, give it grants, loan, give it everything. It will become so dependent on the handouts that it will die when the handouts are withdrawn. So I am one of those who believe that cooperatives should be formed not because it is included in the five-year plan, but because there is a need for it. Because that is the only structure that will transfer to the farmer the largest share of the consumer's rupee without any middleman owning the processing plant, sucking off margins. That is why daring is tailor-made for the cooperative structure. Because this is a highly perishable commodity. To be marketed twice a day, every day of the year. And to be marketed within a few hours of production. Farmer has no bargaining power. That if you don't pay me this price, I won't give it to you. He can't say this. That is why cooperatives are necessary. And that is why throughout the world, it is cooperatives that handle the milk. And in America, for example, which talks so much of privatization and so on, 75% uh, of the dairy industry is cooperative. Uh, how do you think other, others, other players can emulate the success of Amul? It is being emulated and that is why Mr. Lal Bahadur Shastri, when he was the Prime Minister, came to Anand and informed us that uh, what he would like to do is not to stay in my house as was planned because there are no guest houses in Anand, it's a small town. But he would like to go to a village and spend the night as the guest of a small farmer. Can this be arranged? Then when government of Gujarat uh, informed me of this, I informed the government that you should not send policemen there. Because then uh, the small village, 300 policemen, it will no longer be a village. It will become a police camp. So the chief minister sent for the home secretary and told him this. And he said, that's all very well, but if something goes wrong, it is I, my neck, that is at stake. So, but I understand Dr. Kurian's point, and we will work together to have some arrangement. The arrangement was, no one will know, just no one will know that the Prime Minister is going to spend a night in a village. Secretly, he will be taken to the village. And not even the village will know till he arrives there. And therefore, when you see no one in a village wants to harm any 
anyone, let alone a prime minister. What we are all bothered about is that one mad man who, knowing that the prime minister will be unprotected, will go to that village uh, and maybe have a pot shot at him. It is this one mad man, every country has mad men. And it is therefore kept as a secret that he was going to a village. Only two plain clothes policemen were sent to the village. And the instructions were if there is any stranger in that village, if there is anyone not belonging to that village, arrest him and take him away. So the Prime Minister's security was assured. And he spent the night. He ate with the farmer and his family. He then walked around the village, talking to farmers and their wives, going to the hut, sit with them and talk. Then he will say, where are the Muslims? And he will go to the Muslim farmer's house and ask him, are you also a member of the cooperative? Do you pour your milk also? Are you voting also? Then he will go and say, where are the Harijans? And he will go and sit with the Harijan family. Is your milk also accepted? Are you a member of the cooperative? Is your milk also going into the same can along with the high caste milk? And do you stand in line in the queue? And do you stand ahead of the Brahmin because you came earlier? Does the Brahmin agree to stand behind you because he came after you? So he went into all the details of the functioning of the cooperative. And next morning when I went to the village and I showed him the working of the village cooperative society. And then he came to Anand, then he was staying in my house. Then we got to, he saw the dairy and so on. Then he said, come sit down, I want to talk to you. And what he said was very significant. What he said was, you know, I went and stayed in a village because I know this dairy is a great success. Your trade name is very famous. You are growing every year. As against 100 dairies owned by government, all are miserable failures, all are incurring losses. They are not satisfying those who buy milk from it. They are not satisfying those who supply milk to it. So I wanted to come to Anand to study what is the reason for the success of Amul. What is the secret? I therefore spent the night in a village. Now Guri and I looked at the soil, good soil, but not as good as the Indo-Gangetic plain. I looked at your climate, cool in winter, very hot in summer, but so it is in most parts of India. I looked um, at the rainfall, 30 inches of rainfall, three months of the year, but so it is in most parts of India, nothing special there. I looked for vast availability of fodder and feed, so I don't see it. I thought the whole place may be a green carpet, it's not, it's like the rest of India. I looked at your animals, the buffaloes. I am sorry to say that they are not as good buffaloes as uh, I remember seeing in my villages of Uttar Pradesh. I looked at your farmers, good people, as farmers always are, but not as hardworking as the Punjabi farmer. So I looked at every element that would have contributed to the success of dairying in Kerala district and I have found no secret. Now you tell me, is there a secret? If there is a secret, what is the secret? After spending a whole night in a village, I have not discovered any secret. So I told the Prime Minister, sir, the secret is very simple. This dairy is owned by farmers. It is managed by elected board of directors, elected by the farmers. In their wisdom, they have understood that to run a dairy, you need professional management. So they have appointed me as the chief executive of this cooperative. And I have been left free to build up my team. And so it is, uh, it is a business which is commanded by farmers. And we all of us are responsible to the board for our jobs. And I am not on deputation from government. If I do not satisfy my board, I lose my job. I have no father-in-law here to protect me either. So I will damn well see to it that the farmer board is kept happy. Now, if there is a dairy that is sensitive to the needs of farmers, which is responsive to their demands, that dairy will succeed. And so the secret is farmers should own the dairies. Then the Prime Minister said, if that is so, this can be replicated throughout India. Dr. Kuren, from tomorrow you don't work for Anand, you work for India. I will give you whatever money you want. I will create uh, any institution you want. Uh, but I want Anand to be replicated. 
because true development is development of people and to develop people you must involve them in the processes of development you must place in their hands the instruments of development so that's what i see here and that is what india needs so would you please agree then i said uh, well if you wish but i will continue to be an employee of farmers i will not want to be an employee of government i will accept no salary so the prime minister agreed then i said the headquarters of this body should not be in delhi he said why not i said the climate of delhi does not suit me then i will not come to delhi so it is that the national dairy development board was set up by the prime minister with its headquarters in anand and with me as the chairman some 31 years ago now the ministry of agriculture did not take kindly to this the bureaucracy felt that what is this prime minister doing he has created a dairy board he said to be understood that we in the ministry of agriculture are not doing our job is it to be understood that we have no dairy division we have a dairy division is the prime minister expressing a vote of no confidence in the ministry and let us see how this fellow will do so when i went with the blank check of the prime minister to delhi though the minister was favorably inclined the minister's name was c subramanian very good man the i could get no money not even one penny so mr subramanian and i told him that look nobody is wanting this so i'm going home then subramanian said to me dr green can you can you create anand without our money i said of course can you create the dairy board can you replicate i said yes i can then please do it so we have done whatever we have done with no funds from government Uh, Kurin, there is a constant debate uh, between the Gandhian and the Nehruvian uh, thought of uh, the building of India, the building of the economy of India. Uh, which, which thought are you of? Both of them were unanimous in their view that the Anand pattern was the right thing to do. In fact, Jawaharlal Nehru came to inaugurate uh, the new dairy no, we built. That might be so for Anand, but uh, what I'm saying is, is the industrialization, the heavy in- machinery. the view of you see it is quite clear that the backbone of indian economy is agriculture and um, you cannot have a healthy economically healthy india if you do not strengthen agriculture i don't think jawarlal nehru was opposed to that idea either but he followed the russian pattern uh, of development and he wanted an infrastructure heavy industry and all this first to be done whether he was right or wrong uh, i think um, it's good that he built the steel plants it is good that industry received uh, some encouragement but i don't think he meant it as a discouragement to agriculture and having had the privilege of talking things over with him at his during his visit to anand and he had come twice uh, it i am quite clear that he was very pleased with what he saw in anand in fact when he was leaving it pro- put both his hands around me Do you think the government has uh, neglected the agricultural sector? Generally, it is not a glamorous sector. The glamour is in steel plants and uh, atomic power stations and so on, sending rockets to the skies and so on. That is the glamorous part of it. The plodding, the non-glamorous, but the more worthwhile part is increasing agricultural production. I don't think government will ignore agricultural production. but have they do you think they have they could have done more but uh, in fact why should government do it why can't farmers do it themselves i am one of those who do not want to depend on government to do anything if they will not come in the way so much the better that is why i am asking government to liberalize the cooperative sector even before they liberalize uh, the other industrial sector that is why i have difference of opinion with the economic policies now being followed of liberalization globalization and so on i do not want uh, other advanced countries to dump their surplus production in my country at uh, heavy subsidy as you know europe and america exports dairy commodities with a subsidy of 65% now that sort of game is not good my government should retaliate by putting anti dumping duty to protect our farmers in no country in the world including america 
his farm was not protected. Then why should it not be in India where 74 percent of our population are farmers? In fact, this afternoon there is a meeting with the finance minister on this very issue. And all the chairmen of the district unions from Gujarat are coming and meeting him. And I am grateful to the minister for agreeing to meet us. We hope to talk to him that this OGL on import of milk powder should be stopped. Uh, what about land reforms, coming back to the, the government's role? Uh, do you think enough has been done in land reforms? You know, the problem basically is, um, it is a very difficult thing to implement. And while it is true that the size of land holding does not necessarily affect the yield per hectare, while this is true, in certain cases large tracts of land can be more quickly developed than small pockets of land. Now, if industries are, can be big, I don't know why agriculture should not be big. What is required is the agriculture provides uh, rural employment. Now, in making agriculture big, you do not want to destroy the employment potential in the rural sector of our people. For example, I don't want a farmer to own 200 cows. Um, I would rather he owns only two. And he owns that many animals that he can feed on the byproducts of his farm. We also do not want to develop dairying in such a manner that it creates a conflict between man and beast for land and its produce which clearly means that we have to first feed the men. There are 900 million of us and we are barely able to feed them. We are self-sufficient only because 40 percent of our people live below the poverty line and have no money to buy food. If they all buy food, there is, there is a great shortage of food here. So under these circumstances, to divert land from food production to feed production for animals is not possible, is not desirable. Therefore, our policy that we follow in dairying is to feed our animals on what is left after man has eaten. What is left after man has eaten is rice polish, wheat bran, or rice bran, wheat polish, oil seed cakes after he has eaten the oil, and most important of all, straw after the crops are harvested. So, we have to produce the milk of India on the byproducts of agriculture. And therefore, not for us, the prima donna of a whole steam Friesian, which will produce 60 liters of milk a day. When you feed it in this manner, you can only get 6 liters a day. And you should be satisfied with it. What should be the country's agenda for the future, uh, economic future, economic agenda for the country? I believe our future economic policy cannot ignore the fact that 40 percent of our people are living below the poverty line. And if you have a market driven economy, 40 percent of the, our people have no place in that economy because they have no money to operate in a market. Therefore, our economic policy must necessarily have a socialist content. We must have a safety net for the 40 percent of our people. So, purely market driven policies that are talked about as liberalization, globalization and so on is not on. That is number one. Number two, I do not think in agriculture we can open up our boundaries for advanced countries to dump their products. That cannot be done and should not be done. I have a feeling these fine sounding words have been invented, globalization, liberalization by advanced countries in order to economically penetrate our consumer market, which is a very large market, and we should not fall into that trap. So I have differences of opinion on this uh, sort of policies, and I have expressed it openly, even as I am doing it today. Thank you, Dr. Gurian. Thank you very much.